Good morning, Grace Church. Let's stand and sing together. My God is merciful and mighty I have forgiveness by His blood And even though my sins are many My God remembers them no more Jesus, the Holy Son of David You are the way, the truth, the life You know sin, but you became it And by the cross I'm justified I'm a child of the one true King My only hope is Christ in me This is the song my heart will see Oh, I am found in But now alive in you Your resurrection is my story Oh, by faith I stand approved Oh, I'm a child of the one true King My only home is Christ in me This is a song my heart will sing Oh, I am found in you My past cannot pursue me My sins are washed away Your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days all my days i'm a child of the one true king my only hope is Christ in me This is a song my heart will sing Oh, I am found in you I'm a child of the one true King My only hope Christ in me This is a song my heart will sing Oh, I am found in you Oh, I am found in you This morning I'd like to turn our hearts and our attention and our worship uh, to the Word. So let's turn together to Acts chapter 17. Uh, I'm going to be reading verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it 
being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There's two important things I like to pull out of this passage. First is that God does not live in temples made by man. Um, it's not these buildings that we create. It's not our 220 Bogey Lake Road uh, that God dwells. But when we become Christians, God dwells inside of us. And collectively, um, with God's spirit inside of us, we are a temple for the living God. Uh, there's this passage um, in Colossians. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. That's Paul and Timothy talking to the church in Colossae. And we have that same thing happening right now. Even though we aren't meeting in the proper church building, collectively as the body of Christ, we can still worship together in spirit. The second important distinction is um, that God gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He gives us life, breath, and literally every single thing we have. Um, This is so awesome to think about uh, because a lot of times we just go through our day-to-day life and we don't think about the fact that um, every breath that we take is literally a blessing from God. Uh, It just greatly changes our perspective. So I would like to encourage you and encourage myself uh, to take a moment to turn our heart to reflect on how gracious God is to us and how um, just loving he is for us and to be able to pour our hearts out to him in love and in truth and in spirit together as the church. So let's continue to sing together. see your face will you take me there again you can search my heart in the deepest part from beginning to the end to you my eyes are lifting rising up you've captured my attention consume me consume me God give me a heart of ever after you alone golden Like Jericho, come and tear down my walls. I am in your hands, you are the promised land, you're the king of my heart. Let's sing together to you, my eyes are lifting. To you, my eyes are lifting. rising up you've captured my attention consume me consume me God give me a heart abandoned ever after you alone golden
When I've been the fool And I hid from you You still called out my name When my flesh is weak Will you help me see You are all that I need soft to you, a heart that desires to grow in you, to know you for who you are, Lord, and a heart that desires to change, to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the relationship we have you with you. Lord, thank you that you love us so much that you discipline us. Lord, I pray that our hearts will never grow cold, will never grow hard, Lord, but that it will be soft with the desire to know you more fully and to obey you and serve you with our entire heart. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. It is great to be with you today. I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible and open it up to the book of Nehemiah. Tom will be finishing our series in this book this morning, and so we will be reading all of chapter 13. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now, before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses of Shelemiah the priests Zadok, the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites. And as their assistant, Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wines, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah 
in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elijah, the priest, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me. O oh my God, for good. Please pray with me. Oh, Father God, we recognize that you are King of kings and Lord of lords and that you are set apart, holy and mighty. We thank you, Father, that you are a God marked by steadfast love and faithfulness to your people. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for how it nourishes us. We thank you for this book of Nehemiah. We thank you for all the treasure that has been gleaned out of it by our pastors in this series. And Father, we ask that you would um, help us to finish this book strong this morning. Bless the work of Tom's hands. Use it, Father, to um, expand our knowledge of you and uh, open our hearts to the truths of your word. Would you please, Father, uh, use it to bring yourself glory and honor. In your name we pray. Amen. We all know what it's like to uh, experience a high point followed by a low point. It's like when you complete a huge project at work, or you pull off a family event, or you participate in a large, long-anticipated celebration, and then you go back to your ordinary, monotonous life. We've all experienced that before. I remember uh, several years ago, 17 years ago, in fact, when our first child was married. She wasn't our first child, she was actually the second, named Margaret, but she was married uh, first, and I felt intense enjoyment at the weddings of every one of my children. But Margaret stands out probably because uh, she was young, and we were young. It was a huge event that we'd never done before. Margaret lived at home until she got married, and so her loss was very keenly felt at that point. 
And Laura and I just couldn't believe that our little girl was getting married. All four of our parents were present at the wedding. I mean, there were just a number of things that came together to make it a, an extremely memorable event. And what I remember is getting up the next day and I could hardly move. I had planned to come to church, even though I didn't have any responsibilities that day, and I didn't come. Uh, we had to have people over because there were people in town, you know, family members, and I don't remember anything about it. All I remember is this feeling of such a letdown. All of that work, all of that anticipation, all of that enjoyment, it was suddenly over. Well, you know what that's like. Uh, you experience a, a high and it's followed by a low. And that's what you experience when you read the last chapter of the book of Nehemiah, the 13th chapter. The high point of the book came at the end of the 12th chapter, which we looked at last week with the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem. And that's followed by this chapter, which is a list of problems that Nehemiah continually had to face in the governing of the city of Jerusalem and the province of Judah. And what makes it even worse is that Nehemiah chapter 13 is the last scene of the Old Testament. It's the last event that we read about in the Old Testament. I know it's not at the end of your Bible. The Bible isn't arranged chronologically, but this is the last thing we're told about. What a note to end on. A series of mundane problems. And this morning what I want to do is I want to ask the question, why? Why would the Old Testament end on such a sour note, such a problematic, uninteresting, dull list of the same problems that have been faced by the people of God for the centuries before that? So here's what I want to do for the next few minutes. Um, first, I simply want to explain what's going on in this passage. We'll, we'll take a a few minutes to look at the different problems, and, and then we're going to try to answer the question, why does it end this way? Why does the Old Testament, the story of the people of God under the Old Covenant, the covenant made by God through Moses the mediator with his people of Israel, why does it end on such a note as this? Why? In order to understand this ending, you need to understand why we've come to this point. So let me briefly review the whole uh, story of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Originally, they were one book. It's evident that the, the account was not written by Ezra or Nehemiah. However, the book of Ezra contains something that is usually called the Ezra Memoir because there are parts written in first person by Ezra. And then the second book contains parts that are called the Nehemiah Memoir. And apparently an editor brought these things together and put them into a continuous story to give us the book that is in our canon as God intended us to receive it, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. They uh, tell the story of what happened after the exile when the people of Israel who had been scattered out of the land make their way back to the province of what is now called Judah, to the city of Jerusalem. What happens? To them. Ezra, that book, opens actually in 538 BC, long before Ezra was on the scene. It opens by telling the story of the return of the people under Zerubbabel, who was one of David's descendants. When Zerubbabel brought them back, they began to rebuild the temple, but they immediately experienced opposition from the surrounding uh, foreigners, foreign nations and people in the area. They wrote back to the king and, and, and the workers were forced to stop for a period of about 20 years until the Persian king gave his permission, affirming their right to rebuild the temple. And they move on and they complete it. And after the temple is completed, then the story of Ezra picks up in chapter 7. Ezra uh, in 458, we've passed 80 years, he comes to the city of Jerusalem and he's a priest who begins to teach the law and help the people to deal with a number of spiritual problems as they are living a very spiritually lax and, lax and uh, languishing lives. 
They're not used to living by the law of God. And then Nehemiah opens. Nehemiah is sent by the Persian king 13 years after Ezra in 445 BC, almost 100 years after the story opens with the return under Zerubbabel. Nehemiah comes back, sent by the Persian king as the governor of the region of Judah for the express purpose of rebuilding the walls and reconstituting the city of Jerusalem. He leads the people of the city or the province in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, which is a massive undertaking uh, taken on by a group of people, few of whom had any concept of what it meant to build walls, but they had a heart for God and a heart to do it. They experienced, as we read the book, intense political opposition from the other provinces around them and, and the kings of foreign nations. And against all odds, they persevere in the building of the walls and we're told that they completed the building of the walls of, Re of Jerusalem, reconstituting it as a fortified city and the capital of that province in 52 days. You expect them to celebrate that intensely, but what happens immediately after that is that both Ezra and Nehemiah together lead the people from the province in the city of Jerusalem in a time of covenant renewal with teaching and worship and confession of sin and a commitment uh, to obey God's word with keen enthusiasm. And the people commit themselves to entering a covenant with each other to keep the law of God. And then after all of that is over, we have the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem as we looked at last week with a province-wide massive celebration in which two groups of people are put up on the walls and each contains a choir and certain leaders from the nation and they, they walk marching around the walls in opposite directions and end up on the east side where they enter into the temple and they continue there to worship God with passion and sacrifice. It definitely is one of the high points of the Old Testament in which the city of Jerusalem is again recognized as God's holy city. And then comes chapter 13, which is, was just read to you. You know, one interesting thing about this chapter, which is also interesting about these two books, is that the chronology is kind of difficult to follow. I mean, look at, look at the passage. Verse 1 says, On that day, implying the same day as the dedication, a certain problem arose and they recognized it and decided to deal with it. Then when you look at uh, verse 4, it says, Now before this, and another problem is listed, and then in uh, verse 6, Nehemiah says, While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. We're told that Nehemiah was gone for some unspecified period of time, that he went back to Babylon, some four-month journey at least, and he reported to the king, since he was an emissary, a governor appointed by the king. We have no idea how long he stayed there. But when he returned back to Jerusalem sometime later, other problems arose. I mean, what you have here is you have a series of things that have been brought together to kind of summarize the condition of the people of Israel at the end of their history, according to the Old Testament. The chapter is a summary of a series of issues. They were both social and spiritual problems that Nehemiah had to confront before, during, and after the completion of the walls. Now, what were these problems? Well, let's just think about them briefly. There are five specific problems listed. The first one, uh, which is really a twofold problem, occurs in the beginning of the chapter, is um, what you might think of as the problem of unconverted people in worship. So here you are, chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found that no Moab, Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. 
As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now, it's very possible that our New Testament, New Covenant sensibilities are offended by this uh, thought that someone would be excluded from public worship, especially because of their nationality, although that's what's being described. But we have to remember this. Under the Old Covenant, the people of God were a special, specific, national, ethnic, religious identity, a people group. That's not the way it is now under the New Covenant. We are a transnational group of people. People drawn from all the different nations formed the church, but Israel was not like that under the Old Covenant. And while this verse doesn't note it, these verses, um, there really, according to law, was no problem with a Moabite or an Ammonite entering into worship as long as they fully identified with the covenant people. Um... King David's great-grandmother was Ruth, the Moabite woman, of whom the book of Ruth is written. I mean, there was no problem with the Moabite coming into worship. These verses are speaking of unconverted people coming into the worship of Israel, and that's what was not allowed to happen, and so the people deal with that. Then it goes on, verses 4 through 9, they're really about a variation of the same problem. In this case, there's this man named Tobiah who keeps... Uh, popping up throughout the account of Nehemiah. Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem from his visit to the king, and he finds that Tobiah has taken up a room in the temple as apparently his base of operations. Tobiah is uh, identified elsewhere in the book as Tobiah the Ammonite. He's apparently identified as an Ammonite, Although he has a good Jewish name, so it's possible that he was of a mixed race, but he apparently was not identified with the covenant people. He was a political operative, as he appears throughout the book. And here it is. He's been given a room in the temple that was identified as a place for a different purpose, the storing up of certain gifts that were to be given by the people for the uh, uh, care and maintenance of the temple and the temple personnel. And um, Nehemiah kicks him out, rather unceremoniously, you might read. Now, those two problems are really the same thing. They're dealing with the problem of unconverted people being given some kind of power and presence in the temple, in the government of the Assembly of Israel. And then you move on, verses 10 through 14, deal with a second problem, and that is the neglect of tithes. The system of tithing was built into the Old Covenant to be a way of supporting both the religious system and supporting the government, in a sense. And the tithe was to go for the maintenance of the one tribe, the Levites, who had no land of their own. They had cities that were allotted to them to live in when they weren't serving in the temple, but they really didn't have loan or their own land. And so as a result, they were to be supported by the tithes, the 10% that the people of Israel gathered and gave to them. And uh, this was one of the very problems which had brought about the exile to begin with. One of the things the prophets railed against was the refusal of the Israelites to care for the maintenance of the system of worship that God himself had set up in the law. And so Nehemiah deals with this very forcefully as he did with the first problem. Then we go around, verse 15 through 22 deals with another problem, and that is Sabbath breaking. Um, this was another one of the reasons, the chief reasons for the exile to begin with. The people of Israel were not regular, at least not all of them, in their maintenance of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, according to the book of Exodus, was given as one of the key signs of the covenant. By doing that every week, the people acknowledged that they were a part of God's covenant people. They rested from their regular work. They trusted God to supply for them. And here they were, having been brought back graciously from exile, restored in safety to their holy city, and they were repeating the same error their ancestors had committed. And Nehemiah deals very forcefully with that. And there's another problem. It's, a, again, a problem of intermarriage, slightly different from the first one. This is one that Ezra had dealt with earlier in the book of Ezra, but apparently hadn't solved the problem. It had to do with marrying foreign people. 
And um, Israelites could marry foreigners as long as those foreigners became worshipers of Yahweh, the one true God. But what they were forbidden from doing was marrying a person who served another God. You couldn't marry a person, allow them to bring their household gods, their idols, into your home and set up their worship alongside the worship of the living God. You couldn't allow them to be a part of the community where they would set up their own idolatrous worship or try to syncretize it, mix it together with the worship of the true and living God. And, and just like before the exile, that's exactly what they did. They did what was really the chief cause of the exile, idolatry. And Nehemiah had to confront it. And finally, there's another problem in the last few verses of, of the chapter. It, it only briefly describes um, that there was a failure of the priest to maintain the worship system in purity, and Nehemiah deals with it. And so what you have here is you have a series of skirmishes between Nehemiah with an obstinate people and a pig-headed priesthood, and that's where the story ends. That's where the story of the Old Testament closes with a list of mundane problems. Same problems they were facing from their earliest days. Now why? That's what we want to ask. Why does the first part of the Bible, the first two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament, why does it end in this way? And I have to tell you, the answer is very important to understand. It ends this way in order to underline with a dark black line and bold print one very important truth. God wanted us to understand it with real clarity. And here it is. The Old Testament is an unfinished story. The Old Testament is an unfinished story. If you read carefully the Old Testament of your Bible and you think through the chronology of what happens, you are left with the people of Israel whom God called, appointed, formed into a holy nation, gave a land, built a temple, all of those things, and then they were exiled. They're brought back graciously to the land but when you read it and you finish the story, it's kind of sort of like reading the first two books of the Lord of the Rings and stopping there. It's unfinished. You're left with all these questions. There are promises that God made dangling out there that are unfulfilled. There are themes that have developed through the story that you don't know where they're going to end. It leaves you hungry to find out, how does this story end? Yes, the people of God are back in the land. Yes, they have a temple and they have a priesthood again. Yes, they still have the law and the prophets, and there are some who are eager to teach them that. But the glory days of David and Solomon are gone, and the horizon shows no hopes that they're going to come back. Israel is a tiny little province in the Persian Empire, swallowed up in the sea of a vast world. After all, when you read the Old Testament, it has a lot of things in there that you read about. You read about the promise of a Messiah, both in the law and the prophets. The Messiah will bring in a new covenant, and the new covenant will involve a work of God in the heart, not just a return to the land. It speaks ultimately of a new heavens and a new earth in which the political systems of this world are done away with and they're swallowed up in the purposes of God and all the wrongs are righted. It speaks of the Gentile king streaming into the city of God to submit themselves to God as, as the people of the God of Abraham. And what happens to all those things? None, none of that has happened when you come to the end of Nehemiah chapter 13. The Old Testament's an unfinished story. And there are three things we learn from the unfinished story of the New Testament. The story that ends with Israel still struggling with obedience at the end of the story, despite the divine grace that has been shown to them. The first one is this. The Old Testament ends this way to show us clearly that the Old Covenant was not able to change the heart. 
The Old Testament ends this way to show us clearly that the Old Covenant, the covenant made with Moses and the people of Israel, was incapable of changing the heart. I mean, I mean that's, that's an underlying theme throughout the Old Testament story. In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5, when Moses recounts a second time the Ten Commandments and the Essene at Sinai, Mount Sinai, where the people received the law, in that passage, towards the end of the chapter, there's this statement of God where God is sort of thinking out loud. And here's what God says after the people accept the law. God says, oh, that you had such a heart always to obey me. I mean, the implication of that little soliloquy of God is that there's something wrong with the heart. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with the heart. And then when you come to the end of Deuteronomy, Moses predicts that someday God is going to give the people a new heart. That's going to happen. A heart that will make them glad to obey, anxious to please the God who's redeemed them. And when Nehemiah closes his account at the end, I mean, it's evident that that hasn't yet happened. He's still dealing with the same old problems that they've had since the beginning. Or take the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah wrote around 850 B.C. Uh, he wrote 200, more than 200 years before the exile actually occurred. But he predicted both the exile and the return long in advance. In fact, Isaiah predicts the name of the Gentile king who 240 years later will allow the people to return back into the land. His name was Cyrus. It's written in the book of Isaiah, written 200 or more years before Cyrus was even born and came around and uh, said that Israel could return. And Isaiah contains prophecies, particularly in the second half of the book, where, where it describes that God's going to restore the people in two ways. He's going to do two things. First, he's going to return them to the land, and then he's going to renew them in their hearts. Those two things can become sign of what kind of uh, intertwined in the story, but they're kept separate pretty much in Isaiah. You can read it in verse, or chapters 42 through 44 most clearly. And, and, and what we have is that those two things happen not at the same time as people might have expected. They happen far apart. We read at the end of the Old Testament the story of God fulfilling the first part of the promise where the people return to the land. That's what the books of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. But they don't appear to experience the renewal of the heart that God promised. That seems evident. And the reason it's evident is the Old Testament is an unfinished story. The renewal of the heart has not yet occurred in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant was incapable of changing the heart. That's the first thing. Secondly, the Old Testament ends in this way to demonstrate that the human problem ultimately is not political, it's uh, spiritual. The real human problem is spiritual, it's not political. You see, after this event, there is uh, no more revelation from God for over 400 years. They're called, at least by biblical historians, the 400 silent years. It was from around 445 or so BC when Nehemiah closes until Jesus is born in 4 or 5 BC. And that 440 years approximately, there was no revelation from God until the New Testament story opens with the birth of the final prophet of the Old Testament, John the Baptist. Now, during those 400 silent years, history is not silent. In fact, it, it, there's more known during that time period than any time period before that. And the simple reason is that uh, Greece rose to become the world empire, and it was superseded and swallowed up by Rome and the Roman Empire, which lasted for a thousand years, then reigned. It, it was two groups of people or ethnic origins that were east and west, 
you might say. They formed Oriental culture, as it's called historically, and Occidental culture, that is Europe and eventually America, came out of Greece and Rome, and they were writing people. Starting about 500 BC, we have a massive, comparatively, amount of literature of philosophers and writers from Greece and Rome. All kinds of things happened, massive data. We know a lot about that time, but it was silent in the sense that there was nothing written down that the people of God accepted as being a part of the scriptures after the closing of the canon of the Old Testament. Now, there's another thing that happened during those four years that's so important to understand. The Old Testament was completed, you might say. The New Testament was not yet opened until the coming of Jesus, but during that 400 years, what we now call Judaism and the Jewish people arose and developed. Um, Judaism came about as a result of the exile. So it's only at the very end of the Bible when the people come back to Jerusalem and they begin to rebuild the walls in these books that the Jewish people are called Jews. And the reason is because when they came back, they returned to a province that was named Judah after the final remnant of David's kingdom that fell last. He was from the tribe of Judah. Everybody who came back, regardless of what tribe they came from, came back to the province of Judah, and so they were called Judahites, which became Jews and Judaism. That developed during the... the the uh, time period of the 400 silent years. And it's very important because coming out of this chapter, uh, Judaism developed as a very diverse group of people, but uh, in their diversity, there were two broad streams within Judaism that you find when you open the New Testament. There were those who believed that the real problem of the descendants of the Israelites, the Jewish people, their real problem was political. They believed that they were under the domination of foreign powers, first Babylon or Persia, then Greece, then Rome. They were under the domination of foreign powers, and in order for God's promise to be fulfilled, he needed to send the Messiah who would be a political leader. He would fight for their supremacy in a world that ignored them and suppressed them and made them just a little group on the margin of, of the world society. That was one group of people, a very vast group, represented probably most clearly by the Sadducees in the New Testament. And then there was another group of people within Judaism who believed that their problems were primarily spiritual. They acknowledged as they read the Old Testament that their hearts were not right before God, that the deliverer, the Messiah who would, would come would be a spiritual deliverer he would forgive sins. He would restore them to God and to God's favor. Now, those two, you might say, ways of looking at life, a political deliverer or spiritual deliverer, they weren't, at least they aren't, according to the Old Testament, mutually exclusive. The Messiah is going to be both, according to the Old Testament. But what the people didn't understand was the order in which they'd be done. Jesus would come the first time as a spiritual deliverer. And he will come a second time, which has not yet happened, to be a political deliverer. The new heavens and the new earth will be the end of the political order as we know it now. The reversal or righting of all of the wrongs that have been committed, the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Jesus is going to do both, but they could not figure out exactly how he was going to do both of these things. And so some people expected a political deliverer and others expected primarily a spiritual deliverer. And because they couldn't see that clearly, that confusion is written all over the pages of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels. That's the setting into which Jesus came. That's why people kept asking in different settings, is he really the Messiah or isn't he? He does some things the Messiah is expected to do, but there's other things he's not doing, like uh, destroying Rome. You know, the issues that, that uh, confront the human race, according to Scripture, are intensely spiritual. The problems that confront the human race, even in our day, they will never be solved by any kind of political process or movement because the problems are in the heart of human beings. I don't say that to say political process is wrong or evil. No, we're encouraged to be a part of it. 
but the best that we're doing at that point is salt and light to slow down the spread of evil in the world. We who are Christians ought to know better than anyone else that if you don't can change the hearts of people, changing their conditions won't do anything at all. But every, every generation of human beings raises up a new crop of people who are convinced, despite all that history has taught us, they are convinced that they are going to produce the utopia that we long for by the political process, by education and public welfare and bigger government or whatever it is. In all of those ways, we are going to bring in this lasting society we long for the two world wars in the last century seem to have proved conclusively that the heart has to be changed. In fact, if there's any conclusion in Nehemiah, it's just a demonstration that you could take the people out of Babylon, but if you don't take Babylon out of people's hearts, nothing changes. That's what happens at the end of Nehemiah. The Old Testament ends with this anticlimax, a continuation of the same mundane problems to show that the Old Covenant was not able to change the heart and to demonstrate conclusively that the human predicament ultimately is spiritual, it's not political. And the third thing, finally, is that the Old Testament story ends in this way, in order to boldly highlight that the new covenant is the completion of the story. The new covenant established by Jesus, promised by the prophets, that we call the New Testament, is recorded in our New Testament. That is the completion of the story that's unfinished in the Old Testament. The New Testament finishes the story that ends in Nehemiah 13. I'd like you to turn with me for a minute to the Gospel of Luke, if you have a Bible, Luke chapter 2. This is found on page 857, if you're using one of the Bibles from the auditorium here. Although if you're using a Bible from the auditorium here, you must have stolen it. So you might want to think about bringing that back after this is all over. Anyways, uh, page 857, Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Luke was Paul's traveling companion. He gives us more information in the first two chapters of Luke about the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding it than all of the other Gospels do. And a number of things are written in the first two chapters of Luke that are meant to underline that the story of the Old Testament is picked up and completed in the New Testament. But I just want to note briefly two people who appear in the story, only here, never again. Um, 40 days after Jesus' birth, we read in verse 22 that Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, took him to the temple to engage in a small ritual required by the law. It would be a ritual that would allow Mary to enter back into public worship because she was excluded from it during childbirth and during her healing after childbirth under the law. And during this small and private ceremony between these two people and a priest, there come up two unrelated old people that come up and they both say something that expresses their certainty and their gratitude that this baby in Mary's arms is the Messiah, the long-awaited answer to all of their problems. The name of these two people are Simeon and Anna. Let me just read, if I can, beginning in verse 25. The account of Simeon in the temple, this old man. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, 
that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Now, all that he's saying there is the time of fulfillment has come. He even sings this song. By the way, you may have sung this song. If you grew up in a tradition like the Lutheran Church or the Anglican or Episcopal Church, they sing this regularly. It's called the nunc dimittis, which is the Latin words, now depart. depart. Lord, now let us thou depart thy servant in peace. It, it, it's an important element of the New Testament because here was someone at the end of the 400 silent years looking back on the history of the people of God and waiting anxiously for the appearance of the Messiah. God had told him, you won't die until you see the Messiah in the flesh. Anna does the same thing. We won't look at that now, but it's uh, these two people, these godly people at the end of their lives looking for his coming and saying when they see him and when Simeon takes the child in his arms, it's here. The time of fulfillment has come. We won't live to see it in all its fullness, they're saying, but it's here in this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Old Testament ends on such a dull, uninteresting, anticlimactic note, a, a list of problems that they were still facing at the end of their history. It ends that way so that we would know that it's an unfinished story and that we, the people of God under the new covenant, have the fulfillment of everything that God promised in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can count this man, Simeon, though he is still a part of the old covenant at the point even of his death, we count him as being one of our people. He rejoiced in the one who would be the one to fulfill all of the promises. We thank you for that. We pray that you would give to us that spirit that reminds us even on this day of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, that you would remind us that we are the recipients of your promises. We don't have them all yet either. The final fulfillment awaits his return, but we have in Jesus Christ the certainty that all will be fulfilled. We praise you and thank you for that. We offer you our hearts, pray that Despite our conditions at the present time, you would guide and lead us and you would draw us to yourself. And we pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory King of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn But sacrifice was made As the heavens rolled King Jesus Oh hail Lord of heaven and earth Oh hail King Jesus Oh hail 
Savior of the world. There was a moment when the sky lit up. Flash of light breaking through When all was lost he crossed eternity The king of life was on the move For in a dark cold tomb Where our Lord was laid one miraculous breath And we're forever changed Oh, hail King Jesus Oh, hail Lord of heaven and earth Oh, hail King Church, thank you so much for joining us here to worship together online. Uh, we're going to move into a time of giving this morning. Here at Grace Church, we believe that giving is a part of our regular act of worship, and so I want to encourage you to do that with us now. There's a passage here in 2 Corinthians that says this about giving Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. This says a lot of things about the way we give as Christians. It says that we should give uh, regularly, that we should decide in our heart what we should give uh, beforehand. And it says that we should give out of hearts that are uh, moved by gratitude uh, for what God has done for us. And so I want to invite you to do that with us this morning. Uh, let's pray over the offering and uh, allow God to do what he wants to do with that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to gather this morning here online. I pray that this would be a blessing to not only the minds of our believers, but to our hearts as well. And I pray that we would be moved to act out of um, uh, worshipful um, hearts and that you would even cause us to do that in the way that we give this morning and that you'd use these gifts for your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for watching our service this morning 
and on behalf of the elders and the staff who are meeting regularly in a virtual way in order to continue to think about the encouragement of our people and the growth of our people. And, and I just want to tell you that we are really praying for you. We have a list of needs that we're seeking to meet and many of you are involved in that and we're grateful for that. Next week, Sunday, is going to be Easter Sunday and I'm sure you feel, as I feel, a, a sense of uh, loss this year at not being able to meet together publicly. But I trust that God by his spirit will meet our needs in every way and that you will be able to gather at least with those in your home and watch the service and uh, hopefully find yourself encouraged to follow the Lord and seek him as you move forward. Let me know that there will be a service on Good Friday this week. You can watch that service and spend some time in reflection upon the death of Christ, which we celebrate on the distinct day this Friday. So please take advantage of that as well. We're going to post, as we have been, our Easter Sunday service on Sunday morning at 9.30. May God keep you in his grace and give you the heart and the spirit that longs to follow him.